gamification, the promise of taking boring things and making them fun. Our brains are built around games, but when does a task become a challenge? Our definition of a game is usually linked to enjoyment. If an activity is satisfying, then there's a good chance it has some of the qualities you would see in a game scenario. But there's one even more important element that helps us to define when something is a game. Control. Our brains are highly tuned to recognize patterns. You do something, and something happens. This is the fundamental mechanism that all games employ. They set up a framework that offers some kind of predictable reality, which you get to interact with. Babies and young children latch onto these simple frameworks from a very young age. Cause and effect. Same cause, same effect. We're interactive creatures. We love seeing our actions make something change. And that effect only gets stronger when we affect other people. Once you understand this dynamic, you will start to see games absolutely everywhere. Handshakes are a very simple copy me game. You hold out your hand and, hopefully, someone shakes it. So why don't we normally look at simple actions like shaking someone's hand as games? As we grow up, we generally develop a taste for complexity and an appreciation for limits and challenge. Here's an example. Let's take the familiar handshake game and add a twist. This time, when you hold out your hand, the other person is going to run away. You can still shake their hand, but now you need to catch them first. Even adding just one layer of complexity, challenge, or limit to a simple cause and effect game can totally transform the level of engagement. In this case, adding one additional objective to the simple everyday task of crossing a bridge totally transforms the experience. But there's one other reason why handshake pursuit or the bridge crossing water fight might be enjoyable, the unexpected. The second or third time somebody runs away when you go to shake their hand, you may feel the desire to play the game diminishing. The unexpected is very exciting, but it only works once or twice. Most adults need more than one layer of limit or challenge before they will continue to enjoy a game, and complexity needs to be high enough that the unexpected continues to be unexpected. So to turn anything into a game that's truly enjoyable in the long term, we need complexity and layers of limit and challenge. But that doesn't mean that something can't become a game for the short term. In 2009, Nike released a men versus women running game that was built into their running app. For the purposes of this video, I'm gonna overlook the fact that this isn't helpful from a gender point of view and look at this as a historical example of gamification. But if you're interested in diving into this topic, I would suggest this excellent write-up by Grace Clare and Lucy at Reed College. The app kept account of the miles run by its male and female members and added them to a public scoreboard. The goal was officially to get people active and low-key to get them to buy more trainers, but its success in either of those areas is probably down to the game dynamic that powers the vast majority of games and sports out there. Respect. While the enjoyment of direct cause and effect is one of the fundamental characteristics of any game, it's sometimes the knock-on effect that are the real prize. The leading contributors to each side's total miles run were posted on the app. The prospect of respect from other players, or in this case, runners, was probably one of the main reasons for people to engage. It's worth mentioning that in many cases it's the prospect of respect that is the motivating factor, not actually knowingly receiving the respect. Winning happens in the mind long before it happens in reality. There is one other source of respect in the mix here. As players, we make a subconscious assumption that to have invented this game, the game designer must have thought the game would be challenging enough. To put it another way, why invent a game that's really easy to win? The really interesting thing about this is that these assumptions are completely based on our innate understanding of what a game is. A challenge. By completing the game, we feel that we are proving the game designer wrong. We have risen to their challenge and thrown it back your move, game designer. This dynamic creates a healthy amount of internal respect. 
the feeling of having kept up with someone else's idea of what is difficult to achieve and succeeded. So are all games about respect in some form? In games, respect is usually born of competition. And competition is a way to compare ourselves and appreciate our abilities or the abilities of someone else. So where does satisfaction come from with non-competitive games? This promotional campaign from VW turned a staircase into a playable piano with the goal of encouraging people to be more active and low-key to buy more cars. <sighs> Motives aside, the joy and playfulness this creates is beautiful. My favourite part is when you realise the notes go up in pitch as you ascend the stairs and down on the way down. It makes you feel like you're in a film or a cartoon. Some people try to play songs and some just like jumping around and making a racket. So why is this so much fun? Playing games of this type is like having a conversation with the game designer and the enjoyment comes from receiving the message they embedded in the experience. It's exciting when you catch on to what they were getting at and receiving that message is satisfying, like decoding a puzzle. The message embedded in the piano stairs is that you have permission to enjoy something simple, and when you do, you find out it's quite funny. In this way, conversation class games are like a gift from the designer of the game. They can be funny, or thoughtful, or transmit a message, or an idea, or a feeling. So can absolutely anything be turned into a game? The best games usually begin with something that's already fun. It's often difficult, although not impossible, to work in the other direction and start with an objective, such as climbing the stairs, and create a game to match. Fold It is a gamification of protein folding, a complex natural process that is notoriously difficult to predict and test. Scientists have historically used supercomputers in an attempt to calculate the folding dynamics of various proteins, which if successful, might contribute to finding a cure for diseases like HIV, cancer and Alzheimer's. Foldit takes this complicated science and turns it into a puzzle game, effectively using the brains of the people playing the game to solve complex problems. Foldit have actually published several papers on their discoveries, crediting the players who beat the relevant levels. Sometimes all it takes is for someone else to throw down a challenge. And sometimes short-term games can become wildly popular, but creating games with longevity is a much taller order, and there's probably a limit to the activities that can light that fire. On the other hand, I've gamified hanging up my laundry, so it does make you wonder, what else could be fun? 